so thanks for having me. Um, uh, this is joint with Simon Anderson at UVA and Alicia Bike, who's a former uh, UVA grad student. Um, and for the grad students in the room, uh, this is this came out of her third year paper um, uh, many, many years ago, but still. Um, so this is a picture I've stolen from uh, uh, Joseph Turow, who's uh, uh, at Wharton. Um, and it's from a piece in the Atlantic, and it's meant to illustrate the idea that it won't be new to anyone at this conference that uh, it's getting easier and easier to, uh, to identify individual consumers in a crowd and, and uh, learn about their tastes. Uh, so to highlight, uh, well, you can't, you can't quite see him here because of the bar across the bar in the bottom. But, yeah, picture, and this is, you know, of all the uh, uh, details uh, listed about consumers. This is perhaps the most salacious one. Uh, Mark might be worried about his privacy on this one. He's placed uh, women's underwear in his women's shopping in his Amazon shopping cart. So, our our premise in this paper is uh, to to launch from the idea that perfect targeting might be possible. We're probably not there yet, but we're getting closer. But at a cost, you have to perhaps pay a data broker. Um, where by, uh, by perfect targeting, what we're getting at is the idea that in this case, given the product, uh, a firm, say Victoria's Secret, might be able to tell Google as a, as a data broker, um, we'd like to, to pay you something to have you connect us to consumers who are just <coughs> And by just like Mark, in the real world, we mean similar to him on as many characteristics as we can match. Where we go with this in the paper is to stylize and say, consumers with that willingness to pay. We can target an exact willingness to pay profile. Now, Mark might benefit from this because what we're going to do in the paper is assume that uh, the company can then offer him a, a customized discount. Um, but of course, uh, he might also have an interest in, in having his property kept private. Um, this is the point where I really I have to admit, we gave an earlier version of this at Oxford. It was sort of, you know, if we didn't know for sure if Mark Armstrong would be able to make it. We're doing price discrimination. We were really hoping he would be there. I realized he was in the audience about at the point when I was going through this part of the slide. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, what did we do in the paper and what questions are we trying to address? At first, I we're going to look at what I'll call laissez-faire targeting. So a world in which the policy is firms can, can do as much of this sort of targeted discounting as they like. It'll be an oligopoly setting. Uh, firms buy consumer data in order to send them, <coughs> them personalized discounts. And consumers are going to face a, we're mainly interested in consumer welfare. Consumers they face a trade-off, they enjoy discounts, but they dislike lost privacy for its own sake. This is an intrinsic preference for privacy. And as we'll see, there may also be equilibrium effects on, on prices due to what's happening with the discounting. And, and those may often be to the detriment of consumers. And in fact, that's the main result for the first part of what I have here, which is that under broad conditions, uh, banning targeting would improve consumer surplus. Or to put it the other way, um, less a fair targeting hurts consumers. Um, even though the targeting is being used to give them discounts. Um, and under some conditions, this is true for aggregate consumer surplus. And on occasion, it's even true for everything. Um, so it would be a Pareto game for consumers in those cases to, to ban it. So since it's probably not realistic to think that the policy solution will be a ban targeted at advertising, that cat's probably out of the bag. Uh, policies might work. Uh, the GDPR has started us thinking about policies that look like opt-in or opt-out. Give consumers the right to, to decide whether to opt into this sort of targeting. Um, opt-outs can't be targeted. They don't get discounts, but they preserve their privacy. And, and here, we have to hedge our bets because we don't really know when we data the sale. Uh, how consumers really act on their privacy preferences and how specific they are and how attentive they are. And when I talk about alert, inattentive, and Walsian consumers here, these are, this isn't a behavioral model. 
These are just different assumptions about the timing at which consumers make this opt-in or opt-out decision. Um, so I'll get into that in more detail later. Uh, the main results we have here are that, I'll say typically, under plausible demand conditions, uh, an opt-in requirement improves consumer surplus relative to less than fair. Uh, and really that's to say in two of these three cases, but there's a case in the middle where it actually could make them worse off. Um, and one of the takeaways I'm going to try to promote here is that it's hard to get policy right um, without really having sort of boots on the ground knowledge of how consumers are actually making their privacy uh, uh, preference decisions. Um, uh, you, could, you could easily get things wrong by, by making an incorrect assumption. Um, okay, so what are the key mechanisms for what's going on? Um, well, it's going to, and I'll again say typically, um, for uh, what I'll call plausible demand parameters, targeted discounting is going to soften competition in list prices. List prices are going to go up. Um, a related factor to this is that when you give consumers the, the right to opt in or opt out, the individual privacy choices they're making are going to create pecuniary externalities for other, other consumers. So in, in particular, in some cases, opting in or out uh, means that consumers exert less individual pressure to discipline prices. Um, and the fact that prices can then float upward hurts everybody. Um, okay, uh, with usual caveats, I, uh, I, I won't say much about this, only to say that um, uh, uh, there, there are certain things that we're not doing in this paper because they've been well explored elsewhere. Um, so here's a picture of what's going on. This is a uh, two-stage price setting. Firms are going to uh, set list prices. Um, and products and list prices are, are public. Um, they become public when list prices are set. Then there's a second stage at which to, for any consumer taste profile of price. This is a profile of willingness to pay for the brand products. A person can target any consumer with that taste profile by purchasing from perhaps a right to serve up a customized price um, or a customized discount data, I should say. Uh, we'll have a covered market, so all consumers are going to purchase some product uh, at whatever price is best for them, discount or list. Um, I don't think I said it, but I should. Products are differentiated, so it's sort of standard differentiated product. Um, so when opt-in comes back in, when I talk about timing, here's what I'm an alert consumer is one who is prepared to, and we have a, even though this is a static model, we have a bit of a dynamic story in our minds here. Um, an alert consumer is one who's prepared to revise privacy choices on the basis of what's going on with list prices. So perhaps you opted out, but all of a sudden today, prices in this market are, are higher than expected. Maybe I should be going for discounts out <coughs> This is maybe a high bar for the vigilance to expect from consumers. Uh, inattentive consumers are going to, to make that opt-in decision before observing this prices. And this is really just meant to capture the idea that um, they, they are keeping up on a day-to-day -day basis with what's going on with prices. Uh, they, they set these, uh, these privacy policies once and sort of forget them after that. And then... Oh, yes. Uh, when you say differentiated products, so every consumer is having a vector of uh, valuations for every product. And so then asking and targeting for a profile is you not only learn the willingness to pay or for that product for the entire vector. It's it, the entire vector. Yeah. <coughs> and, and we've thought about what you're probably thinking the natural other cases, you know, only information about my product. Um, this is, would be an interesting thing to do. Our instincts are that this is hard because it sort of turns it into a, um, it turns the discount competition into a first price auction. Not necessarily hard by itself, but it's an asymmetric one, that's hard. And then the fact that you have these list prices floating around creates uh, uh, um, uh, 
well, other technical difficulties that maybe I shouldn't get into. Um, so the last case, um, and here I've uh, uh, forgot to revise the slide that I called Rawlsian earlier, I've said it for this one. Um, this, in this case, the idea would be the consumer has to make a privacy choice before even learning voting preferences. And we don't mean that really literally, of course, but really this is meant to convey the idea that you make a choice that's meant to cover many markets. Particular market that you might be facing these issues in when you set your privacy decision. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, here's the, the general setup um, for the tasting the end system. Uh, basically, the demand system is whatever you want. Um, uh, there's some primitive distribution over vectors of taste. Uh, all that matters for the purpose of our, our analysis is this reduced form, oops, this reduced form function of the underlying demand distribution that I'll, I'll call captive demand. And it's capturing the distribution of parameters like this, where uh, God is, take an arbitrary firm, firm one. Um, what I'm measuring here is how much better a consumer likes firm one's product than her best alternative. Um, it could be negative. Um, if it's positive, that means firm one makes her favorite product. Um, and capital G is the distribution of that. One minus G is what I'll call captive demand. Um, I want to try to make the case that it's empirically plausible for that captive demand, the one minus G, to be convex. Um, and I'll make two arguments about it here and then move on. Um, the, the first is just that this seems plausible based on everyday uh, experience. Uh, convex captive uh, demand means that the, the density of consumer taste gets thinner into the tails. Um, and this is the density of the number of consumers who like my product a certain amount more than the next best alternative. So perhaps we think this is reasonable. A better uh, justification might be that we get this automatically if the demand system is generated by IID taste shocks. So any multinomial choice model, as long as there are standard regularity conditions on the underlying distributions, gives you this this kind of captive demand. Um, okay, so I need to illustrate a little bit of what's going on with targeted uh, discount competition, and that lets us get to the, the results about privacy. So I'll illustrate with hoteling, even though this is more general. So we have two firms. I'm measuring the value advantage for firm one going to the left. Consumers going this direction have a stronger taste for firm one. Um, we've got, uh, we're at a second, we're at a sort of in, uh, uh, ex interim stage where uh, uh, list prices have been set. Um, uh, and now I have a picture of what profits on these consumers are going to look like. And I want to identify certain features of what's going on. So let me focus first on this marginal captive consumer who is identified by the condition, remember it costs A to target a consumer with a discount ad. So how far into firm one's territory can firm two reach with a discount ad? Well, the lowest price it could profitably offer is A, you know, without losing money. So this is going to be the, the furthest to the left that it can poach. Um, anyone to the left of that, we call a, a captive consumer for firm one. Um, Likewise, firm two will have some captive consumers. Um, they don't get targeted. They suffer no privacy cost. They pay less prices. Um, in the middle, we have contested consumers. These are consumers who are poachable. Um, they're going to end up getting discount ads. And what will happen in equilibrium is that each of these consumers is sort of an individual battleground. They're all contested one by one. And in general, with more than two firms, it will be their top two firms that target them and no others. Um, the, the equilibrium and the strategies 
involved in discounting end up being mixed, basically because you have this fixed cost to advertise to the consumer, plus Bertrand undercutting. There's no pure strategy for looking at that. In principle, this could be a mess, but it turns out the profits, the expected profits of the firms, which are what we really need for the analysis, uh, end up being Bertrand-like in the sense that for consumers who like Firm One's product better, Firm One's profit is just its value advantage. Um, uh, for, for those who like Firm Two better, Firm One earns nothing. Um, so our focus here is good, though, going to be more on the consumers. So let me take a look. So here I'm thinking for a contested consumer, how is discounting affecting your, uh, your, your consumer surplus relative to what would have happened if you just paid list prices? Um, so firm one's profit has dropped down to here. Consumers don't gain that entire difference. The expected benefits from discounting for a consumer at this location are given by this function that I've labeled cap delta for, for discount. It's an expected benefit. But there's a, an efficiency gap, which arises because the, the mixed strategy competition is whose costs of advertising uh, are just a welfare loss. And there's also no misallocation because sometimes you buy the wrong product. Um, let me maybe leave this and come back to it. I'll just say that when it comes time for consumers to make privacy decisions about whether to opt in or out, the, the calculus they're making is essentially to ask whether my expected benefit from discounting exceeds a, a privacy, a personal idiosyncratic privacy cost, C. Okay, so, so the first uh, question I wanna ask before we get into the question of opt-in and opt-out policy is just to say, are, is, is this sort of discounting making consumers better off? Would they be better off if it were just paid into um, so, um, in order to think about that, I want to, you know, illustrate and uh, point out a few facts about what a, a list price marginal profit expression looks like under standard oligopoly. That's on top. This is entire list. And then down here, with unrestricted targeting, this is what a firm's marginal profit expression looks like. And one thing worth pointing out is that we say this is of a quasi-monopoly uh, marginal profit expression in the sense that it doesn't involve the other firm's uh, uh, list price at all. Right. And as pictorially, this is true because the margin at which your list price is determined is separated by a sort of a buffer region of head-to-head -head competition from the other firm's list price. The, the two list prices are never competing head-to-head. So our result um, is that, uh, I just want to make sure there's nothing down. I don't think there's anything that I've cut off down below at the bottom. Um, the result is that banning targeted discounts reduces list prices if and only if captive demand is convex. So this is a statement about list prices and that will lead <coughs> into the question of whether consumers are better or worse off. So in this case that I argued is most plausible for the demand, um, uh, targeted advertising pushes list prices up. So why is that true? Um, I wanna come back to these marginal profit expressions and do a bit of a comparison to illustrate why this, this might be true. And the thought experiment here is to say, let's fix the other firm's price at, so my NT is gonna be no targeting, at the equilibrium list price <laughs> with no targeting. Um, and let's ask, what would my, as firm one, what would my marginal price be, or my marginal profit be, evaluated at that equilibrium no targeting price? In the first case, the answer is it, it's zero, sort of by definition. In the second case, it's going to be positive under laissez-faire targeting. I'd actually like to price higher. So why is that? There are essentially three effects going on here. One is that um, the, the most competitive uh, uh, opponent price I might ever have to face 
is, is more aggressive with targeting. Oops, sorry about that. So it is to say, I'm pushed deeper into my own territory. I have fewer captive consumers paying my list price. Um, that effect tends to push my marginal profit down. All else equal, I'd like to cut my price to be more competitive. There's another effect though, which is that what I lose at the margin when I price a little bit higher and lose a, a list price consumer is less. It's, I don't lose my entire profit. Let me show this picture again. All that I lose at the margin is A. And that's because this consumer was barely poachable by my rival. I can win him back with a very small discount. I just need to advertise him. It turns out that those two effects cancel. We're left with this third effect, which is as I get pushed deeper into my own territory, going from here to here, is the marginal consumer, what's happening with the density, <coughs> more or less price sensitive? And if captive demand is convex, the marginal consumer here is less price sensitive. Um, that gives me incentive to push up my, my price. Okay, so this feeds into, let's go, oh, okay, so let me move along a little bit. Um, the, the first main result, which is to say that uh, uh, um, uh, targeted discounts um, are, are going to reduce aggregate consumer surplus. If this convex, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if this captive demand function is sufficiently complex. Um, rationale is basically that list price increases can swamp everything else that might be going on for consumers. Um, as an example, this is true for, for any logit demand system. Um, um, so with, with opt-in policy, let me just reiterate, you have an idiosyncratic privacy loss as a consumer drawn from a distribution H um, if, you, uh, uh, if you opt in, in which case you might face targeted ads. Uh, I think I've talked a little bit about the timing, so let me make sure in the, the four minutes I've got now I get to a few of these pictures. So to illustrate what happens when we switch to this opt-in policy from, let's say, fair targeting, and in this case, I've got the, the increasing Y running to the white, right? So consumers to the right have a stronger preference for firm Y. Um, these consumers are captive, these are targeted. We switch to an opt-in policy, and now there's a frontier of consumers right here at this frontier who are just indifferent between the benefits that they get from discounting versus the privacy loss that they suffer. So we now have a margin for, for the firm in setting its list price that looks like this. Okay. So how does this affect incentives to raise your price? Well, roughly speaking, you have a margin of some consumers that if you raise your price, you lose them to the other firm's list price. That's a standard oligopoly incentive. And somewhere it's a little bit closer to the case I mentioned just a moment ago. The short version of the story here is that the consumers down here tend to push your list price up. The consumers up here tend to keep it at the level of standard oligopoly. So for sufficiently convex captive demand, um, uh, this case is, is going to be intermediate. Price is going to be above what it would be in standard oligopoly, but you're going to bring it down from what it would be with, with targeted advertising, uh, unrestricted. Um, and, and that can, can benefit consumers uh, uh, if, well, there's a, there's a condition on row convexity under which this benefits consumers. Um, so the, um, the second bit that I want to make sure to, to point out if I, if I run out of time is that this can be a little bit sensitive to how closely consumers are paying attention to their privacy decisions. So my inattentive consumers 
were the ones who, the only difference is that they're, they're making their decisions about whether to opt in or out on the basis of the expected price level. They haven't waited to see what observed price levels are. <coughs> this ends up making them vulnerable to hold up. These consumers, if list prices end up being a little bit higher than they expected, have no recourse. They aren't anywhere close to being interested in paying some other firm's list price. And their next best option, switching to opting in and getting some discounts, they've already committed to not doing. The only consumers who are actually disciplining the list price, that is not true. And part of the difficulty with that is we're relying to, on, on uh, uh, consumers to discipline the list price. The ones who are at the margin and are prepared to pay another firm's list price, those are precisely the consumers um, who are most attracted to opting in to get discounts because they could go either way. They like both kinds. Um, so they're going to, the set of them that are left is going to be only those who care quite a lot about lost privacy. Um, so this case is, is harder to get general results on. The, the holdout problem creates technical difficulties. But we, in the working paper, have an example in which switching from unrestricted targeting to, to this opt-in uh, policy makes almost all consumers worse off. Prices rise so far because of the holdout problem that even though consumers have saved on privacy costs, most of them are worse off. Um, let me maybe skip that and just show you one last picture, um, or this is sort of a good place to wrap up. So if you have consumers who are trying to make a choice that covers all markets, um, and they're choosing on the basis of an expected discount averaging across all markets, what might an equilibrium look like then? And the main point to take away is that there's sort of a feed feedback loop going on. So, if I write lambda for the fraction of consumers who decide to opt in, lambda is an increasing in function of expected price levels. The higher you expect list prices to be, the greater the benefits from opting in to get a discount, so the higher lambda. But likewise, for firms, um, oh, this has been cut off a little bit, the, the equilibrium that comes out of competition between firms for reasons that I've described earlier um, involves higher prices when more consumers opt in. So these things circle around on each other. This is an example of what an equilibrium outcome might look like. Both reaction functions are upward sloping. The good news is that any equilibrium leaves all consumers better off because it's at a lower price than they would have had with unrestricted targeting. The bad news, perhaps, is that you quite reasonably could have multiple equilibria here, depending on what these reaction functions are shaped like. Um, and then the policy question might become, well, how do you shift consumers from a bad expectation to equilibrium? So I should wind up. I won't say uh, all of this. I think I've made these points. And uh, we have some limitations, and we have some things we're planning on doing next. Talk about that later. Thank you. Mm -hmm.